going on today. Thank, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Roberto. So I ceased to be a philosopher as a result of working in a very practical context with people in biology and medicine, where ontologies, in a sense which I will explain in due course, are used in order to bring about all kinds of improvements in the way in which people share data or describe data or plan to collect more data. The, uh, the, uh, idea of using similar methods in philosophy is an idea which I've been toying with uh, for some time. I'm not, I don't want to do philosophy anymore, but I don't mind helping philosophers. And um, so the, we, we can start by comparing philosophy with medicine. So for a long time, until quite recently actually, medicine was an art. It was not a science. And one of the goals of the people I work with who are using ontologies in order to, to collect medical data more accurately and adequately, one of the goals is to get rid of any idea that medicine is an art and to replace it with an idea of medicine as a science with real algorithms so that you're not resting on the magic healing touch of the, uh, of the doctor artist, but you're rather relying on real data results with r known statistical likelihoods as a result of the fact that we have performed the, the corresponding processes over and over again in similar circumstances and we've collected the data in each case so that we have a good baseline for deciding what to do in each new case. Now hospitals are still very dangerous <laughs> places, so I feel quite safe in this room from specific French infections uh, but we are in fact surrounded by hospitals and uh, nowadays people are trying to find ways of using computers in order to reduce the dangers of hospital infections and I don't really believe that we will ever replace philosophers with computers it would be a good thing but uh, in the way that one day we may very well replace many of the things that doctors do with computational counterparts. But I do believe that we can gain some of the benefits. So just think about that for a minute because I'm not going to talk about medicine or infection anymore. So the Vienna Circle thought that we could unify science and the idea was that the way to unify science is to formalize scientific theories using first-order logic. It was a very good idea. Um, it failed. And the reason it failed is because in order to succeed it would have rested on a huge project of standardization which would be analogous to the uh, international system of units which is ISO 80,000 which has many parts this is just the generalities part one uh, it, the, in order to make the Vienna Circle project of unified science work you would have to standardize all terminologies of all sciences and that's an incredible social anthropological project as well as a logical formali formalization project. And um, so extending the, the methods of ISO to the terminologies of all sciences would mean building the terminology of biology for instance where it deals with chemistry on the exact terminologies used in chemistry for the relevant chemical structures which would need to build their terminologies on the exact terminologies used by physicists to talk about the underlying physical structures and that would be very difficult. Now in the 1970s in Stanford there, were a, a, a there was a group of people who were trying to use a broadly Quinean idea based on first order logic in order to create artificial intelligence. So this was a much more modest goal although still quite immense in if it had been practically realized to formalize the content quite immense in if it had been practically realized to formalize the content of human common sense using first order logic and they called these formalizations ontologies so borrowing the word from Quine effectively so this is one of the first printed uh, examples of the use of the word ontology in this practical context so the context for for the Stanford people was robotics 
they wanted to teach a robot to buy salad. Now that means the robot has to have an ontology of tomatoes and of gripping devices and of customers and, and of money and so on. And that's what they tried to build and, and Patrick Hayes was one of the uh, most uh, successful of the people working on this project and um, he, he created something called the Naive Physics 96,000 Axioms to formalize human common sense. And uh, so and he worked with McCarthy. So McCarthy was uh, commonly uh, described as the inventor of artificial intelligence. And this was, this was really strong AI in the sense that they wanted to build artificially intelligent, first order logic driven counterparts of human beings. And this is a collection of papers, including a revised version of, uh, of Patrick Hayes' Naive Physics Manifesto. Now, this led to various things. First of all, there were lots of people building ontologies. Uh, they regarded this as a kind of knowledge representation, or knowledge engineering, as they called it. And in order to I enforce standardization across these ontologies, they needed a standardized format which was engineering, as they called it. And in order to I I enforce standardization across these ontologies, they needed a standardized format, which was called the Knowledge Interchange, interchange Format, KIF, which is commonly associated with the name Tom Gruber. And this gradually became OWL, which is a, uh, a, a fragment of first-order logic which is used to formalize ontologies in the context of what is nowadays called the semantic web, which was Tim Berners-Lee's idea of the new next generation of HTML. It would be a much more rigorously formalized, constrained way of creating web content. And it's important to note that Daml, da DARPA DAML, which was the intermediary link between KIF and Tom Gruber on the one hand and OWL on the other hand was, was financed by the American military. That will be important. Science Research Projects Administration, I think, or agency. All right, now, oddly, and this is one of the great miracles of, of modern science, the world's first institute devoted to the study of these ontologies was founded in Italy, in Padua. And uh, it was founded by this gentleman, Nicola Guarino, who has become a good friend of mine, although we hate each other, um, who published uh, some of their earliest and most influential papers on this new formal ontology and the way it would be used in information systems. And his institute had a fire in 1993. And he tells a story that there were only two books which survived in the library of Ladzeb. One of them was Aristotle's Categories. <laughs> and the other of them was this book, which was uh, a collection I edited basically on Merriol. To use the phrase formal ontology was Husserl um, in the year 2000. Actually, no, 2013. This is in the second edition. No, 1913. Sorry, wrong century. <laughs> no, wrong millennium. <laughs> All right, so. This, this is the, uh, the, the beginning of the table of contents of uh, this book. You see Kevin Mulligan's name here already, and you also see Aristotle. And then you see the development of formal ontology through the work of Husserl and then the Gestalt psychologists. And um, this, this, was re this book was truly influential on the Italians working in Padua. So th they, they say that as a, res as a result of my influence, they became philosophers. They were engineers uh, by union card. And I say that as a result of their influence, I became an engineer. All right, so a paper was presented by this same gentleman, Tom Gruber. Um, so th this was really a very important meeting and hugely important for nearly everybody in this room. I assume that nearly everybody in this room has an iPhone and the iPhone is full of ontologies. So Siri is based on ontologies designed by Tom Gruber. And they are like this. <coughs> so we have, this is the ontology of things you do in the evening, basically. So you go to movies and you go to the theater and you go to the restaurant. 
And these are all universals in the ontologies used. Th this is not exactly what is in the series, but they look very much like this. So a restaurant can have a style. It might be a sushi style restaurant and so on. And, um, and then there are particulars. So San Diego is a city and, and so forth. And this is updated constantly every time people use Siri. And, um, and then there are particulars. So San Diego is a city and, and so forth. And this is updated constantly every time people use Siri. More particular <laughs> information is added to the ontology. And the ontology itself grows as a result of new kinds of movies. Or and so, so the ontology is up there and then the databases are down there. And the, the, the ontology is used to organize the data, to describe the data, to make the data findable, and most importantly, to reason with the data. Now, the first application of the ontology idea that was truly scientifically successful was in biology, and this is where I became involved with ontology research. Something called the gene ontology was created, and this was created by biologists who were heavily involved in the human genome project or yeast or zebrafish genome <laughs> projects and they wanted all the genomes to be comparable but they wanted the comparisons to throw light on biology rather than on chemical sequences so they wanted to know which gene sequence in the mouse corresponds to the gene sequence in human beings which is associated with cleft palate formation, for instance. And so they needed terms for things like cleft palate formation to describe gene sequences. They created the gene ontology, which is a vocabulary of biological terms. And they didn't know anything about Stanford's semantic web ontology project. They just liked the word ontology. They thought it would be a good word. And they reinvented some of the same ideas that had been invented in Stanford, but for strictly biological purposes. They were biology. Some of the same ideas that had been invented in Stanford, but for strictly biological purposes. They were biologists. But they used a very interesting phrase, which will remind us of the Vienna Circle. So the idea is that the gene ontology is species neutral. It's not about mouse cleft palate, it's about cleft palate, or about cell, or cell division, or cell death. It's terms which you would use for any organism. All right, so the Vienna Circle project failed, but the Go was tremendously successful. So it's used now in every big medical lab, in every drug company, it's used as a tool to link knowledge that we have about proteins, for instance, to knowledge that we have about diseases. It's a controlled vocabulary. It's exactly the kind of standardization that I referred to earlier as being a necessary... But, but they were more modest than the Vienna Circle. They didn't want to unify the statements of science. Can I have some water? They wanted to unify the terminologies of science. Oh. I guess you can have the one he brings. All right, so um, this is what it looks like. This is a small fragment. There are something like 40,000 nodes in the gene ontology. So we have cytokinesis after meiosis, which is a kind of cytokinesis, which is a kind of cell division, which is a kind of cellular physiological process, which is a kind of cellular process, which is a kind of biological process. And then we have some Mariology. So we can do reasoning with Mariology. Now we have more relations pertaining to regulation, for instance. One process regulates another process. Positively regulates, negatively regulates. To regulation, for instance. One process regulates another process. Positively regulates, negatively regulates. And now what you do is you go through the scientific literature and you tag all the terms in the literature and all the data in the literature using gene ontology terms. And there is a whole career path now of bio for biologists, which is called biocurator. And biocurators are PhD biologists who spend their days reading papers and tagging them 
not just with gene ontology terms, but with terms from other ontologies, because now there are hundreds of ontologies, many of which were built to work with the gene ontology. They extended the gene ontology to other parts of biology. And, and now you can find all the papers which refer to cleft palate formation in, in mice um, and discuss the role of alcohol in mice, for instance. That's just a completely random research idea, which probably will lead nowhere. But you can do that now. You can find all the papers, all the proteins, all the genes, all the diseases involved in any given biological phenomenon, because there are millions of data items which are tagged using the gene ontology. So n not just papers, but also data have been tagged using the gene ontology, and in a coordinated way. So you can use these tags to find the data you need, to find the papers you need in the species you're interested in. Uh, but most importantly, you can then use the ontology to reason across those data. So this is called logic. All right, now what the gene ontology did works uh, because the biologists have an interest in unifying their vocabularies. Every scientist, uh, because the biologists have an interest in unifying their vocabularies. Every scientist has an interest in unifying their vocabularies. The successes of ontology and biology have not been replicated in physics. And I think I understand the reasons for that. Physics is mo already much more unified than biology because they only have, well, they don't have any species. Biology is diverse because there are so many species. Um, but in biology, they were able to show that this work because, works because biologists too have an interest in unified vocabulary. And even more so in the age of, of DNA, because they are presented with a huge unified vocabulary in the form of gene sequence chemistry. But in philosophy, and I keep wanting to make jokes about French philosophy, but that's so passé now. <laughs> so, in philosophy, no one cares about unified vocabulary. So philosophers, th 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 they don't work hard to find out who has used a term with what definition in advance of them, because they don't expect to find definitions anyway, in any formal way. People sometimes formulate definitions. Roderick Chisholm, uh, who is a hero in this respect, used to work very hard to formulate definitions of his terms. But Chisholm was an outlier. All right. Now, so in many cases, philosophers don't define their terms. Their meanings change more or less at random. And new positions are invented, which were in fact already invented several times over, but using a different terminology. And so no one notices that they are in fact reinventing something that was already um, put forward by uh, people in a previous century, uh, they are in fact reinventing something that was already um, put forward by uh, people in a previous century. Um, the, in, in biology, the, there is an obsessive effort to collect all data and make it accessible openly. In philosophy, well, we'll talk about this uh, later, in philosophy there is very little in the way of a systematic attempt to have the corpus of philosophy presented in such a way that you can find out what it contains easily and automatically. All right, so, and this is true, of course, not just for philosophy, but for the humanities in general. And, and that's partly because we don't have anything like empirical testing in philosophy, but we can still have many of the benefits of public domain corpora, of philosophical texts, philosophical secondary literature, philosophical interpretations uh, in such a way that people can, everyone knows what they're changing, what the meanings of the terms were originally, how these terms are being then reused with new meanings, which means new identifiers. So in the gene ontology, you don't only have the terms, you also have numerical IDs. So that if the definition of the term changes, which in biology has happened, then the term itself may stay the same, but it will get a new ID. Philosophy has nothing like that. 
All right, and, and so this is a, a paper by Ariane Betty and colleagues. She is one of the few people who's really keenly attempting to formalize philosophical content, uh, inspired by Bolzano uh, in this case. And she complains about how people write long papers, uh, trying to f uh, formulate, formulate precisely the meaning of one term. And uh, it's just another paper. <laughs> Um, you just have all the data and then you, you, you use your computer to work out the consequences and within a few minutes you have the results. Where publishing a paper takes a year, in philosophy probably longer. And by then several patients have died. I mean, not in philosophy. Alright, so this should be the solution. Um, I I take it you all know something about Phil Papers. So Phil Papers is a, an online philosophy resource which does give you a certain opportunity for checking philosophical content, for finding treatments of topics and so on. They now have Phil People which does the same kind of thing for living philosophers I guess. They don't pay any attention to the classical literature. This is just published papers of recent date. And David Chalmers is the um, eminence grise, the um, eminence grise uh, behind all of this. Um, and now they have uh, created something new, which is called Phil Archive, which truly is attempting to be a definitive corpus of philosophical publications in the public domain. So this is what we need. And I'm going to say nasty things about it in a minute, but. I will start by saying wonderful things. I think it's fantastic. It should have been done a long time ago and it's great that it exists. All right, and it's growing. Uh, but uh, Plato isn't in there. Um, even though Plato is freely available, they could put it there. All right, and um, so as I said, the gene ontology allows logical reasoning. It's that they have definitions which have logical forms and you can use a computer to reason using the gene ontology. It's not just a terminology. Now, unfortunately, the, 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 there is a category list which is used to tag the papers in Phil Archive, uh, as in Phil Papers, which is the basis for Phil Archive. And it's not an ontology. And it was not built by anybody who knew how to do ontology. So these are some of the terms in the category list. And they, they used to tag different things. So who the hell knows what epistemolo epistemology miscellaneous is and how it differs from epistemology misc. <laughs> and um, that's not the worst. I, so there are four categories uh, which you find if you enter the term aging one of which is brain im aging <laughs> and so the, the reason is that they, this isn't an ontology an ontology is designed to help human beings find things so that the computer can then reason with them automatically quickly and you can't reason with this and you if, unless they change their uh, practices you never will be able to reason with this so a priority and necessity is not a kind of the a priori and that is not a kind of epistemological sources and epistemology is not a kind of metaphysics and epistemology so this is an index which is populated on the basis of the standard way of dividing courses in anglo-saxon curriculum lists and uh, so, and th they provide no definitions of anything. Now, of course, human beings know what these, well, I don't know what the a priori misc is, but human beings know if they're working in definitions of anything. Now, of course, human beings know what these, well, I don't know what the a priori misc is, but human beings know if they're working in philosophy what the synthetic a priori means. But again, computers need definitions if they're going to reason with content. And in my view, the whole point of tagging the content of philosophical texts is that one day we will be able to reason with those texts in something like the way which computers now can reason 
with the texts of biology. All right, so how shall we do this properly? So we create a formal ontology and various material ontologies, and you can understand what that is. Um, and Saint Bonaventure already saw why we need a formal ontology. A formal ontology would be the highest ontology, which contains primitive terms, like object or process. Because if we need definitions, we can't define everything. There has to be somewhere. Aristotle has been um, less influential <laughs> in the biological domain than something called basic formal ontology, which is very much inspired by Aristotle, but which contains more in the way of spatial and temporal distinctions and various other. For instance, we have dispositions in here. We have sites, which include holes with an H, um, which people used to talk about in the olden times. And, um, and we have functions, roles, and so on, which Aristotle didn't really uh, have. We distinguish between continuance and occurrence between dependent continuance and independent continuance. And then we use this to create material ontologies, such as the mental functioning ontology, uh, the emotion ontology, which, which extends the mental functioning ontology. And this is, these are some of the terms in the emotion ontology, which, which extends the mental functioning ontology. And this is, these are some of the terms in the emotion ontology, so muscles becoming tense, breathing at a slower rate. And these are some of the types of feeling in the emotion ontology. And um, maybe we'll add feeling disoriented one day. Who knows? We have a very long list of feelings, emotions, emotional dispositions, physiological um, counterparts, uh, appraisal types. It's a very big ontology, which was built actually primarily by a, ke a chem informatician by the name of Jana Hastings. Uh, I don't know if she has a fondness for alcohol, but there is a certain connection between chemistry and emotions. Uh, so that, for instance, you can define happiness in chemical terms if you link the chemistry ontology which, with the emotion ontology. And also you can study affective disease, dopaminergic system, downregulation to depression. Um, that's a gene ontology term. All right, there are many ontologies now which extend BFO in this way, 281 in the public domain. And I'm not going to talk about things which you can't no know about. And these are some examples. And one of them, the common core ontologies, will be important in a minute. Now, the BFO is like a back plane. It's, it's like a standardization which people can plug things into with an insurance that they will um, be compatible. And th the responsibility for such compatibility lies with the International Standards Organization and with the International Electrotechnical Commission, which standardizes plugs. So they have a wonderful website which describes all the plugs and where they are uh, standard. So in France, you have type C, uh, which plugs. So they have a wonderful website which describes all the plugs and where they are uh, standard. So in France you have type C, uh, which is um, in Greenland. Well, actually type C is pretty much international. It's only United States uh, and one or two other Anglo-Saxon countries that don't use type C. But very few countries use type E, uh, France for some reason. Uh, and th th this is all standardized. There are uh, technical committees which standardize things like screw threads. And technical committee number 12 is responsible for units of measure. So what we need basically is a technical committee for philosophy. So the joint technical committee, um, ISO, IEC, JTC1, was commissioned by the US Army which, uh, to make BFO into an ISO standard. So we set up a committee um, which is subcommittee 32 of the Joint Technical <coughs> Committee number one to create a multi-part standard. Part one is a standard which states the requirements for being a top-level ontology. And so this is the definition of ontology which we use. 
A category is a general class or type, and a top-level ontology is an ontology created to represent very general categories. And uh, in order to be a top-level ontology, you need to cover everything. That's You can't leave anything out. And you have to have te textual definitions and then axiomatizations in OWL and axiomatizations in common logic. Common logic is, is just a standardized form of first order logic, standardized by ISO, actually. I won't go into the details of common logic, but it's an, it's an interesting artifact. And the question is, how do we uh, test whether an ontology covers all entities? I, I wrote this standard and I had to solve that problem. How do you test whether an ontology covers everything? And um, so this is, this is the table of contents and um, the requirements. That's the hard part. You have to give conformance tests. Those, the basic formal ontology satisfies the requirements expressed in part one. Now, in principle, there could be a part three, which might be called dolce. Uh, that depends on Italy. Uh, in principle, there could be other parts, but at the moment, there is part one and part two. They are almost at the point of being approved. So the, the, the we have one more vote. And we're doing very well now. The, the last set of revisions was only typographical. So we corrected some misprints, basically. All right, so requirements of being a top-level ontology. How do you prove that an ontology covers all entities? Well, the strategy we hit upon was we go through all of these headings and then we require that the editors of the relevant ontology has to demonstrate how their ontology will, will enable the tagging of data under each of those headings. Relevant ontology has to demonstrate how their ontology will, will enable the tagging of data under each of those headings. And um, I'd, I'll, I, I won't go into any of the details here, but I can answer questions about how we do all of these things. BFO is quite small. It only has 35 nodes, where the gene ontology has 40,000 nodes. But it has a lot of axioms. Um, one of the requirements is that we had to prove the consistency of something like 300 first-order logic axioms. Just imagine. All right. Uh, now, this is the final part. Um, so before the standardization of BFO began, we created an ontology of philosophy, which was actually created at the request of the Philosophy Documentation Center. Uh, uh, who, I, I don't know if he's French anymore, <laughs> um, but he certainly was French. Uh, and I, so he was one of the uh, architects of BFO in the early days. Um, we created something called Philonto, which was designed to create a, an ontological basis for tagging the literature of philosophy. And we have various relations. Um, now, remember, this was created in advance of the BFO standardization. If we did it now, we would use... Uh, more conformant terminology, but it's certainly compatible with BFO because we were already we, BFO already existed when we built it. So a person can be a member of a group, a group can be a subgroup of a group, uh, a group can work on a topic, a person can work on a topic, a person can be active in a field, a group can be active in a field, and you see how it goes. So one concept can be a subconcept of another concept. A concept can be in a field, such as epistemology, and one field can be a subfield of another field, and so on. And a field is a philosophical entity. A concept is a philosophical entity. Uh, I don't know whether we allowed that a person can be a philosophical entity. I've forgotten how we dealt with that. So these are the relations. Um, and then the biggest field in all of philosophy is called philosophy. So every philosophical field is a subfield of the field philosophy. This is not rocket science. Um, and the subfield relation actually is, is 
a specialization of the part of relation. So it's not identical with part of, but it is a special of, but it is a special kind of part of. So we have the field metaphysics, and um, the, this field uses the concept of form. Plato was active in this field, and he worked on the third man argument. Plato was an ancient Greek philosopher, although he didn't know that he was ancient. Uh, and he was a realist about forms and, um, and so forth. So what can we do with Philonto? We have something called the philosophy family tree, which is a, an organized representation of all philosophers whose doctor father, so the supervisor of whose PhD dissertation has been identified. It's probably not complete, so they're probably whose PhD dissertation has been identified. It's probably not complete, so there probably are identifiable PhD supervisors who have not been identified yet. But it, it, it was put together by a man called Josh Diva in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm now in charge of it for complicated reasons, uh, but he did a very good job. And so every node in this tree, it's not really a tree, well, it's several trees actually, as we will see. Every node in this tree there was no ur doctor fata, of which all other doctor fathers were children. <laughs> Otherwise, there would be a tree. Um, all right, so this is root one. And here he cheats because Leibniz was not really anybody's doctor fata, but it's such a good place to start. So you get all the way down to Dana Scott and you go through. So this is a like Peter Hare. Um, so this is a really nice lineage to belong to. And many of the people in this room may be in this lineage without even knowing it. And then a slightly less interesting lineage, only because it doesn't begin with Leibniz, is Menk the Menka lineage, which includes Weierstrass and Hilbert and, and so forth. So some nice people. And David Hershenoff is uh, my favorite colleague in Buffalo. Uh, so he gets to be on this slide. And now that's me. I'm in the Weiser lineage, which is not a bad lineage if you like David Lewis, um, and which includes also Kevin Mulligan. And therefore, it includes Roberto Casati, and maybe other people in this room are on this list for all I know. Uh, so Kevin has a pretty good list. Um, and he is an identifiable doctor. All right, so and now we can use it to tag all of the names. So w w there are practically no Italians in the philosophy family tree because the Dr. Fata institution is only relatively recently established in Italy. So the, the philosophy family tree is not g going to be enough as a basis for doing philosophy in the proper way, namely by tagging everything we know using ontologies because then we'll just miss Italy which wouldn't be the end of the world, but it, it would still be a pity. Um, and so we, we are at the moment trying to work out how we will extend the philosophy to family tree. So some, there is something called the, um, now I've forgotten the name of it. It's run from Princeton. It's called something like the science family tree, but they don't use the doctor fata relation. They use the, use the doctor fata relation. They use the influenced by relation, which is much more flexible. And the, the science family tree that they have is very impressive because you can see all the people who influenced um, um, uh, I'm blocking on names of quantum mechanics people. Um, Schrodinger. All the people who influence Schrodinger you can see on a big page and it's hugely impressive. Where if you use a family tree you just get one person who was his senior as it were and then another person already you're in the 18th century and what you want to know is who were the people around Schrodinger and we probably need to do that for philosophy. They do have a philosophy chapter in the science family tree but it's nowhere near as big 
as the philosophy family tree which was put together by Josh Deva. Good. So they're as big as the philosophy family tree which was put together by Josh Deva. Good. So we can now tag all the philosophers in this new philosophy family tree according to whether they were interested in the philosophy of history or the philosophy of poetry and so on. Uh, we can tag the, the concepts that they used, the groups to which they belonged, and um, we can create... Uh, so this is a description of the, of the philosophy family tree. It has 140,000 entries. Uh, it's mostly well populated from around 1930. Uh, if you go to this link, you can find the tree. You can search that tree. It's a PDF file. It takes you a long time to find Roberto Casati because PDF does, is disoriented <laughs> when it comes to such a large diagram. But you can find Roberto Casati uh, if, you, if you know how to, which I linked to from, the, from that page. And um, so you can tag it like this. And, uh, and then what can you do? Well, you can find things. You can find all the people who worked on the third man argument. You can find who wrote about what, who wrote about what they wrote about. You can't do anything like that with the filler archive. Uh, you can reason over what you find. So you can, find, you can detect plagiarism. That's one of the first things that they did in biology when they found that they had all this data available which was tagged. They can now use it immediately to detect plagiarism and they found some very embarrassing examples of plagiarism. And we can't do anything like that in philosophy. Uh, we can't save people from thinking they invented the wheel. And we can't save the bother of having all these human beings arguing about the meanings of terms, which would be really nice. We all agree on the meanings of terms. We just try and work out what the truths were. <laughs>